sure what they last. All right. No. You're no smiling. You're oh, thinking oh, about it, no? Yeah. Uh, you have campus skiing. Yeah. Oh, you went skiing. Was that your first time skiing? Oh, cool. Where did you go? Oh, great. Okay. Yeah, that's, that's good. Well, I guess it counts as success then. I think that could have these degrees. Oh, oh, good, good. Um, so we'll talk more about the degrees today, actually. Um, so just so I, as it looks like by the lack of reports on my desk that everyone got the message that they're not due today. Um, so that's, that's good. The, the, this, the, the messaging system worked. Um, so, um, so just a reminder for everyone, they are due on Wednesday, um, at most one page per person in the group. Uh, so, um, but it could be less, so if you have three people and it only takes one page, that's fine. Um, basically at this point, I just want to know that you've got some, maybe some basic prototype of what you're planning to be working. Right? It doesn't need to be any, anything interesting really layered on top of this at this point. It could just be kind of uh, if you both well, people working together, getting everything integrated, and showing that we have the moving parts together. Yeah. Is it all right if we haven't actually started the data processing yet? If we're still like doing the prototyping and like test data and stuff. Um. So you know, I would, I would prefer you have something basically working. I mean, if, we have it downloaded, if, but you know. Yeah. So you you should have had it downloaded at the point of the data collection report. Now, if your work requires more. Kind of, um, there's more work in figuring out what you're planning to do, and you have that sketched out pretty well. What you're actually planning to do, and, the, the, and, and that took a fair amount of work. That's probably fine. Okay. Um, if if a, if a lot of the the nitty gritty, the details of integrate have been um, um, have not been put together yet. What I'm hoping so, in addition to making sure that you are making progress, you're not doing it all last minute. Also, I'm hoping to. to get a, a much more concrete idea of what you're planning to do for the project so I can actually give some feedback on what kind of more advanced techniques you could use if you haven't already um, kind of um, figured that out. So, you know, what I'm hoping the project is, is a way of, of I mean, the homeworks are your, I'm having you do kind of the core basic things that I think everyone who's going through game mining should understand, right? But to really kind of appreciate it, you want to take some of the kind of the cooler, more advanced stuff I've talked about in the class that hasn't necessarily made it before and had a chance to work with that. And, and also to see this work on, on real data. And so it, it takes some build up to get to the point where you can actually do that. And I'm hoping that you've gotten most of the, you've, you've done all the data collection now and you've gotten the, the basic structure in place. So now you have time to actually experiment with something new and cool on top of that. Um, so hopefully it's enough that you've got the basic prototype working and that you can, and I can give you some more specific feedback. So if you, if you, if you, if you think you're far enough along for that, then, 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 then you should be fine. Um, um, for that okay. um, so also the homework that was due Wednesday, I pushed that also back a week. Um, I, so if people start looking at that already, and that seemed less less onerous than than the previous <coughs> one. So I just gave it half as many points. So I'm hoping that at at most reflection of, of how much work it is, hopefully it's even less than that. Um, but I'd really like you to be focusing on the projects at this point. Um, Okay, um, so so the last lecture was Wednesday before the break, and we talked about PCA and the SVD, and I focused, and maybe this was a strange way to do it if you haven't seen it before, but I focused a lot on the geometric intuition of the SVD, and, and uh, I realized at the end I hadn't really talked about how to use it as much. Um, and then I kind of rush that down. So I'll start by briefly going over that, and then um, what would be the, um, um, the topic of today is more of an approximate version of PCA. So instead of um, doing the, the SVD, which will exact, essentially give you the, the, the exact thing in, in, in many ways of optimizing it, two norm or the uh, previous norm, this will give you 
the, um, the a way that approximates it, which will have um, uh, um, 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 certain advantages. So if you recall, you have, you have this matrix P, which is going to be, um, this is an N um, by D matrix. Um, or you can also think of this as N points in, in, in D dimensions. So these two notions are going to be uh, on the equivalent. And so you can think of P in, in this matrix so that each row, um, um, this is going to be the height uh, point. So the height row is going to be the height point in your data set. And the, and the J, uh, the J column, We'll use this as, as this is a lowercase pi, this is a capital PJ. This will be the J um, dimension. So if you have a bunch of points in the high dimensional space, think of them as N customers, like a million customers, and each have <coughs> attributes attributes about them. And we're keeping track of these. You know, and you can write them as this matrix. Um, and so then what the, what the SPD does is it's an operation you can call in pretty much any, any language, it's going to be built in, and it's going to give you, um, let's see, so the, the SVD of P is going to give you three matrices. Um, so U, um, let's call this S and B. So um, this one is n by n, this one is d by d, and um, this one is on diagonal. And it's, it, it's, the matrix is actually going to be n by d, but it's essentially going to be d by d if d is smaller with everything that's below that is all zeros. Um, and so these two are going to be orthogonal, which means that they're essentially going to be some sort of rotation of their space. But possibly these pure forms. Um, okay, so, um, so, and then what we want to do is we want to approximate this this matrix P, and essentially we're going to approximate this this space. We're going to keep all the points, but we're going to approximate what this d-dimensional space is with the lower dimensional space, and we're going to get out this matrix P K, which is going to be. UK, SK, BK transpose. And if K is equal to D, the full dimensional space, then we're going to exactly recover P up to numerical error with SD. Um, but it's generally a pretty stable operation, but you will of course find this something. So but this P will this P the data will essentially lie in a, in a space that's um, this will essentially lie in a space that's K dimensional. In our case, it's going to be some subspace, um, and these vectors in V are going to capture the directions of the subspace. So let's so U K is is if we have um, is going to be the matrix where you take um, the, the first K um, columns of U, and this is going to be U K. Um, S is going to be a diagonal matrix of um, sigma 1, sigma 2, up to sigma k, where these are the first k entries of this matrix S. And Vk is going to be the, um, the first um, k entries of, of this vector v. So we're just taking the first ones of all of these, um, the first k of all of these, and combining these back together. And the larger k we pick, the more of the mass that we capture. And by the mass, the right way to think about this is what's called the um, Frobenius norm. And um, uh, the Frobenius norm is is going to be 
the square root of the sum over i over j of pi j squared. So it's taking all of the entries of this matrix, squaring each of them, and then summing all these up, and then taking the square root. Um, you can kind of ignore the square root and just think of this, the total sum of the squares. And so think of this as the amount of mass somehow captured by the matrix, and the more larger k is, the more mass we keep. And these sigmas <coughs> actually tell us how much mass are we, are we capturing. So the, the sigma 1 says we're capturing so much of, um, so much of this for being small. And it's, it's what, what amount of this total, this is a scalar value, a single value, and the sigma 1 says how much is captured by this first spectrum. Sigma 2, how much is captured by the second vector? And they're sorted, so this one, so um, sigma i is always greater or equal than sigma i plus 1. Right? And if you go down far enough, they get pretty close to 0, and you can start kind of ignoring stuff. And that means that your data lies in this lower dimensional subspace, in this really high dimensional space, when these sigmas go to 0. Um, and now, um, oh, oh, actually, they're captured by these VKs or these dimensions. Sorry, I pointed to the U before. These UKs are kind of um, kind of uh, where they tell you how this relates back to the original points. So in order to get the, the opposition of the original points, you need these UKs. But to just get the directions of the subspace, you just need the Vs. So the Vs tell you the subspace, the U's kind of related back to the original points. Um, and this tells you the amount of mass. These have no mass because they're a work for thought. Okay, so um, does, so, so you know, I, I I went through this quickly last Wednesday, um, and then I'm throwing back up here again. Is there going to be any questions about the SVD before <coughs> I talk about how to how to approximate it? Does this this make sense? It's, you can, you can call this in MATLAB, and then you can decompose the, you can take these matrices and break them into these pieces, and then recombine them back together, and you get this approximated point set. And it lies in the k-dimensional space spanned by these vectors. Well, these vectors. Yeah. So what's the motivation for these? Um, so one thing is that it's a way of reducing uh, the dimensionality of your problem. So sometimes people will reduce it down to two or three dimensions so you can actually try and view the data, right? Viewing data in high dimensions is, is, is almost pointless or is very hard to do. But if you find the best two dimensions to display it, then you can see kind of how it looks. Um, so that's one way. Also, algorithms may run faster in the curse of dimensionality with algorithms, they may run really slow in higher dimensions, and this may capture most of the important part of the data in, in low dimensions. And so people have, have tried this as well. Um, the, a better approach is usually to find algorithm that will work explicitly better in higher dimensions, but um, so the, so sometimes this is part of it. Um, another reason is, you know, when you have really high dimensional data, you want to understand what are the important correlations in this data? And the linear regression tells you something about correlations, but it's with respect to a particular variable. Say, you only care about the amount of money you're making, and you want to look at all these variables, how they relate to the amount of money you're making. Um, but this says, the, what is the core variation among the data, irrespective of the, the effect on um, the amount of money, just the relationship between different components. So how do, if you're looking at this set of customers, what is the, the, the main kind of a continuum if you wanted to, the first vector here tells you how to lay out all your customers in a one dimensional space versus maybe, you know, the ones who like to look at very kind of um, uh, specialized books versus the one who always look at um, Maybe all books about sports and books about poetry, right? Maybe these are two ends of, of a spectrum, right? And this really will, will lay out 
the best way to kind of think about your customers in this four dimensional space and how they how they vary along this. Um, does that answer your question? Okay. So well, um, so 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 hopefully we'll get some more insights as we talk about the. the approximate variance as well. So there are some things that people would like PCA to do that it doesn't, that the approximate versions will, will give us advantage. Um, okay, so, so I, and, and this program has been heavily optimized, so if your data fits inside of memory, um, you probably just want to call this in, in, in whatever program you have. Um, if your data is fixed and it lives inside of memory. If it's not, fixed it's being updated, added to, or it doesn't fit in memory, then you're, um, you're kind of out of luck with this. Um, I mean, so has anyone tried to run something on MATLAB and it just wouldn't run because it didn't fit in memory? Right, so, so this happens when you try and push MATLAB beyond where it's tried to go, and so people have said, okay, for big data problems, how do we do this SED? It's very useful for, for finding kind of core Kind of variational structure. What, what's the size of uh, like dimension of p that, that would cause like MATLAB to die on SVD? Like, what's the limit about? Well, so it depends on your computer and you can set. And there's often in MATLAB it, there's like a predefined memory limit that they that they put on it. So you and you can usually raise that and then go up to the memory of your computer. Um, but say if you're if you're some company, I mean, not even like the scale of Google. But some, some, some uh, like even a small business, all their customers who hold it, their data, if they have, if you have 10,000 customers and each has maybe um, um, maybe 10,000 attributes, um, that, I don't know, that, that may or may not fit in memory. You actually need more memory to actually run some of these calculations. Although, um, because you need some auxiliary memory to do some intermediate steps. Although it's been optimized to try and reduce that, the more memory you give it, the more, the more efficient it's going to run up to a point. Um, so if you if you run it in MATLAB, it'll take care of that for you. If you run it in C, you need to specify this actually, how much additional memory you have. But the more you give, the faster it runs up to some point. Um, so, but things on Things on the scale of, of, of Google, you you know, or Facebook, they don't have a computer where this will fit your memory. Um, so okay. Um, so we're, we're going to talk about two. Um, so actually, the, the runtime of of SDD is going to be. Let me just put this up here. Is min of n e squared, n squared. So it's at least the size of your matrix, but you take the smaller dimension and you and you actually have to, to square that, right? So just nd is the space you have. So it's not too far from linear, but if both the dimensions are big, then this can be large. If you're just computing the first k components, you can actually do this a little bit, do this faster as well. Um, because the actual way it's computed is it iteratively finds the, the first dominant component first. So you can, you can break that out a little bit and actually improve this to be dependent on k instead of d to, to, to some extent. Um, OK, but so, so even if you can um, improve this, there, there are two things that, that, um, that this is, is not doing, is that um, so, so the, there, there are two problems. So one is it's hard to interpret um, the i, one of these vectors. These vectors tell you the, the kind of the, the core mode of variation of your data. But it's, it's some linear combination of these attributes of your customers. Well, what does this mean? How can we in, interpret, get a representation which is easier to interpret? And then um, um, uh, streaming data. Um, so th this is when your data, when your say your customers, each of the points n is coming in one after another, and you want to maintain 
this bit variation. Um, what you could do is every time a new customer comes in, you can rerun that SPD on the new matrix. Uh, but this will, um, this is going to take, then is, this, if you do this after every step, it's going to take about n squared time, n squared d squared instead of n d squared. Right? So how can you maintain this in a way that's more efficient? And people have, have heuristics for this. There's this incremental SPD, uh, but there's this cool way using something like um, very similar to the Misha Grease analysis or streaming algorithms where you can extend something like that with a small modification and get some nice guarantees on how accurate you are. So we'll, we'll talk about these two things. Um, okay, so, so the first thing is, is how to interpret these, these, these VIs. Let me uh, try and discuss this issue um, maybe a bit more. So one of one of the, the applications of this is um, who was talking about this uh, um, genome um, um, genome data, where what you get is this big microarray where you have these different um, these different tests you do on these on these genes, and you and and, and, each, and and you apply this to a bunch of, of samples, and what you get out are these huge these huge matrices of data, right? And and you can and there's a lot of correlation on the, on these matrices, and there are ways to SP and clustering algorithms that find the biggest mode of variations. Um, and it says that the, the biggest mode of variation is along some some DI will be some linear combination of these genes is most likely to affect the outcome of some test, right? And for a biologist looking at this, this is it's not very useful. What is a linear combination of of, of ten thousand different genes? How is you know uh, what does that even mean, right? So what they'd rather have is give me a set of of distinct genes that each tell me which each have a large um, which which uh, which 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 describe the variation of the pattern. So give me example genes which which describe this variation. Right. Um, so um, what we're going to do, so instead of this matrix V, which is going to have all these key directions in a certain order, what we're going to do is we're going to replace these columns. So this, um, so each VI is a um, linear um, combination of of the attributes of your data, right? And so what we want is that instead, um, so, so what we want is a, um, is a, uh, is a, um, um, it's a set of actual attributes, right? So instead of this matrix VK, um, um, we're going to replace this with the matrix C, and and uh, such that um, each column is a column um, of, of P, right? So each so instead of this matrix V, right? So a, um, a matrix V, um, so V K um, might look like this. Um, where it's got um, these d dimensions, and it's going to have these these k columns, and each of these columns. So if this is v one, it's a linear combination of the attributes. So if this is v k, instead what we're going to do is a matrix C. Um, okay. And each of these rows in the matrix, um, we'll call this CI, each CI is, is going to be equal to some PJ. So, so this is going to be, our, this is going to be a, a, um, a column of, of P. So now if I present this to some, some 
um, some biologists looking at the data, I can say, here are the, here are the, the important genes. And by just looking at these genes, you can see the variation in your data, how this is affecting the, all the different tests that you're running. You, have, you maybe have n different tests on d different genes, and you have picked out some small number of genes which capture the variation. And, and if you, maybe there are other genes that you haven't looked at, but these are going to um, have um, the variation that these caught in, in caused in the results can be mimicked closely by looking at other combinations of genes. So you just need to test these genes. And so while this was K, you're going to need a larger number of columns here instead. We're going to need some T number of columns. Um, in this case, the number is going to be roughly 1 over epsilon squared times K log K. Um, so instead of k, you're going to need k log k, and this 1 over epsilon squared, which is an error term. And I'll, I'll, I'll tell you how this works, and this, this epsilon will tell you the smaller epsilon is, the less error you have in approximating this beacon. And I'll, after I describe the algorithm, I'll state precisely um, what, what these error runs are. And we'll, we'll discuss if, if this is good. Okay, so all right, so I've got this really large matrix. Um, so this really large matrix P, and I want to select these columns P J to create this 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 uh, this matrix C, which represents um, which is going to be used to represent this DK. How? Um, what's the right way to select these columns? How should I do this? <coughs> so does everyone understand what the problem is? Anyone confused about what the, what the problem is? Or what the, yeah? How Right, so um, if, if we remember, the matrix is uh, e you are going to be these orthogonal matrices, which means that um, that means that you can write v times x is it's, it's um, is um, going to be as um, sum of of v i times um, v i dot x. Right, so x, x was, if x was a unit vector, if this was one column, so say x instead of being any input vector was one of the columns, that means I can write it as a sum of the columns in V. Now, vice versa, I can do this that, um, that each of these V, I can also write this as a sum of the, of the columns of, of P. Um, it needs to lie in the um, so let's see it's 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 telling me the uh, right so, so so let me draw a picture here again so if um, if this is my data and so this is and so if my d is equal to two then Maybe this corresponds to column P1, and this corresponds to column P2. And now V might look like this. Maybe this is V1. Should go through the origin. So this V1 is now a linear combination of P1 and P2. Does this make sense? I can write it as any value along this vector. So here is going to be, um, so let's, it's possible that this is going to be um, um, uh, the, the value along here. If it's if it's ten, then if it's even, then maybe this is um, or this is a, a, a distance of one at square root two times p one at square root two times p two, and that's going to give me the value here. So I can represent each of these genes as a linear combination. Is that okay? 
T is going to be the number of columns of C, this matrix which we are using to approximate VK. So K was some number of columns that I needed to represent the variation of my data. So you can look again at the singular values and see when these get small, small enough that I don't care about the mass less than this. And this gives you K. And then you want to somehow get something that has good of a representation as VK, but uses only columns for P. And so you're going to need more, more, more columns in this matrix than you did here. And so this T is a little bit bigger than So if, if I wanted to do this, right, I wanted to use, so now here if I wanted to represent K, this, I, if I want to represent just V1, so K was equal to 1, with columns from here, which are these dimensions, if I just picked P1, I'm going to miss out on all the variation going, going this way. So I need to also I need to pick P1 and P2 in order to capture these. Um, if say there was another P3 coming out here, which there was not a lot of, of data moving along this P3 direction, but maybe V1 moved a little bit up in this way and a little bit down here, but not so much, then I could skip this V3 dimension and still be pretty close to VK by to picking these two directions and not this third one coming out. Right, so, so, so that's what, I, what I'm trying to do. Um, so I wanted to pick these, these uh, dimensions that the data is represented in um, to, to try and find that they have the most variation. Okay, so, yeah? And why do you say that C does not have this probability that each column uh, will be a different combination of attributes? Well, each one is going to be exactly one attribute. So that's still a linear combination. It's one times this one and zero times everything else. Okay, so each color consists of one, one, and the other attributes are Each column will see my approximation matrix is going to be only one attribute or one dimension of the original data. Whereas, whereas in V, this is a combination of all the attributes each of the vectors. It, it doesn't have to be along one of the original axis directions. So, column would be a bunch of zeros followed by one somewhere? Um, well, uh, so in, in, in practice, these very large matrices are sparse, but it's, it's not going to be, you shouldn't think of it as so that there's actually data along each of each of the um, so each of the uh, the rows of um, so each of the rows of P corresponds to a data point, right? And there's and there's information in each of the cells, right? So this cell is P I J, right? And so there's going to be data in here, and so P P J is going to be this column, and there's data in each of them. And this is going to capture C. Now, now, in order to get a projection out here, we want this only to be D, and we're going to need to we're going to need to transform this into a projection matrix um, J C, which is going to be um, so. So this is going to be the projection matrix, which will work like V K. So C is just going to be the columns, but we're going to use this, which will be used to project the data onto a subspace that's spanned by these columns. So these columns are going to be, so the VK, all the columns were, were diagonal. They were all of length one. So they were all of these, this representation of V1 in here is going to be a um, unit vector, where these are the columns. They're not necessarily of length one. Their norm. So in general, pj is is going to be some constant that's not equal to one. We're going to call this wj. And so what this is doing is it's a way of normalizing. Remember, 
that when I take this inverse, it's really like I'm dividing by this quantity. So this is, you should think of this as dividing through by the magnitude, and so I'm normalizing, so this, this matrix is a normalized version of this matrix. And it's the same way that this is an orthogonal projection onto the subspace spanned by these k columns, this JC, this projection matrix, will be the subspace spanned by P1 and P2. Now the columns, um, so you can also think of this as the, um, as, so, so you, you, you can also, there's a dual version of this where you can think of it as instead of finding the dimensions of the subspace, you can think of it as the n data points you want to choose and data points which are representative. And, and these dimensions or these data points are not necessarily going to give you, um, th these columns are not going to be um, orthogonal to each other. Now these, these, these directions of the attributes are going to be orthogonal, but the columns are not with respect to the matrix. If you took the dot product of these two columns, then it's, it's, it's going to be zero if they're orthogonal. But these two columns are not going to be orthogonal, so it's not going to give you, um, if you project it onto this column and th then this column, it's, it's, it's going to, it's, um, you could get more mass than you started with. Um, okay, so I, I, I um, I, I think, I've, I feel like I've, I've confused some people in the class, so yeah. Yeah, I'm confused. Um, okay. So could, did you just have like a simple example in your pocket of, of what a C matrix would look like? Um, um, given some theme? Yeah, I should probably, that would probably be useful to have. So um, there's one in the, let's see, there's, there's one in the book um, not in my notes, but in the, the MMDS book. Um, in order to 